So I'm going to give them a quick update on who CBRE are and our current supply chain strategy. So I'm going to whip through it because the purpose of today really is more to hear from um, Kelly and Ilsa. So Kelly's going to touch on QHSE. So the purpose of this session is really to get you to fully understand what our expectations of you are and what our clients' expectations of us in turn are. So as an extension of us, around about 50% of all of our services are delivered by you, our supply chain. So you must understand our um, QHSE culture as well as our compliance culture. Um, and we've got various tips for engagement. Kelly will go through some of the forms we use. Ilsa will go through a lot of the marketing material that we have. And we're happy to share any of that with you as some of our partners. Um, so they'll touch on that. We then have a quick q and I'm sorry, I haven't updated the times on the agenda either. <laughs> Um, and then we'll, we'll close, probably looking for around about a two-ish close. Um, but we have got the room for the rest of the day if you did want to use the room for networking, etc., etc. So, just some stats um, around um, who we are um, as a business at the moment. So this is a new slide that's just been issued. Um, it came from our, our business unit leaders' day. This is GWS in Amir. So these are. It's a really busy slide, but. The reason that I like it is because it gives some really, really nice stats here. So we're currently managing 6.6 .6 million occupants um, across, the G across the EMEA region. So that's a, a staggering amount um, of people that, that we support within their um, place or work. Um, so we're, we're currently managing around about, we've currently got around about sort of 12,500 people um, working for us. We're managing 1.3 billion square foot of real estate. Um, covering, spanning all different types of um, client areas. So some of those numbers in there, in there are really quite um, fantastic. We're currently working across 22 um, languages, um, spoken and 41 written. That's through our, um, our teams um, on site, our central hubs. And we have a couple of shared service centres um, across um, the EMEA region. Um, and they support all of those um, um, languages and stuff like that. We've got project management. So um, last year, that stat was just over, sort of like just under eleven thousand projects we managed across the across the EMEA region, and most of them were actually done in the UK. So the numbers there are some really fantastic numbers, and the reason I wanted to highlight that um, is because this is what um, we, who we are as a business today, and these numbers should be reflected, hopefully, um, in some of your growth with us as well. So the occupier servicing. So CBRE, as we stand at the moment, we offer the three streams full and a full integrated service when it comes to the management of property. So the standard facilities management, which I think a lot of people would have traditionally associated us with from the Norland days and the JCI days. The advisory and transaction. So that is the asset services part of our business, which has fallen under the um, CBRE GWS umbrella and then our projects business. All of it underpinned by the energy and sustainability part of our business. So we are one of the few people within the real estate business that can offer the full suite of services. So how we're made up? Um, we're made up actually of four divisions now, so this slide needs updating. Um, so asset services came under our wing um, in January this year. We're still not quite sure where it's gonna fit, how it's gonna fit in with us. Um, but we've got the four, the three core pillars there. So enterprise accounts, this is the legacy JCI part of the business. Um, they are, tend to be global or multi-country accounts, um, circa 15 million and above. The types of examples we've got there, um, Philips, GE, Mondelez, um, Honeywell, we've got some really, really nice client names in there. We've got the local facilities management um, clients, so that's the legacy Norland part of the business really. Um, this is um, under £15 million pound clients. Um, they, they tend to be um, uh, one country or less than four, but that's going to change over the course of this year. One of our growth pillars is that we grow the local facilities management part of our business um, across Europe. So the way that we define ourselves will probably change throughout the course of this year and the course of next year. And then we've got the data centre solutions business. So again, a legacy part of the old Norland business. Um, one of our very, very fast growing parts of the business, um, DCS, um, an exciting part of the business to be um, working in. And we've got a couple of members of the DCS um, procurement team here with us this afternoon, so you can hopefully catch up with them later on. Um, so um, they tend, they're single, multi or global country contracts, 
Um, we've got some really, really good names there. We've got, you know, Microsoft. Um, uh, we've, we've got one, some of the Google data centers. So it's a major, major, major growth area for us. Okay, some um, facilities management facts. Now, the reason I wanted to draw these out from you is because I want you to understand CBR, we are a global player. Um, a lot of people still associate us with an American branded organization, still think that the majority of the work is in the Americas. Um, it, it actually isn't. So the EMEA region does make up a very, very sizable portion of what CBRE globally off, um, uh, delivers. So these facts and figures are for the GWS part of um, EMEA. So you can see then out of the 5.2 billion square foot of managed space globally, 1.3 billion of that sits within our, our area. So that's GWS for the EMEA area. So we are not an insignificant part of this business. We're a very, very fast growing part of this business. Um, and um, that slide really does depict that. So the project management element of us. Um, so this is just a very, very quick summary, just to let you know that actually we do the full full array of, project, of, of projects and project management. Um, so not only do we project manage a, a piece of work for a client, um, we also act as principal contractor. Um, we also do um, specialist moves and changes, space management and everything like that. Any type of project need, we can now cover that um, for our clients. And this is one of the fastest growing areas of our business, our projects business. It's another part of the business that has been, it's traditionally been UK centric, UK and Ireland centric and is an area that we're looking to grow um, very, very quickly over the course of 18-19. So the asset services, it's not an area that I know a huge amount about. Um, like I said, it came under our, the GWS umbrella in January. Um, we're still finding our feet with it. So um, we've got a gentleman called Giles Harper, who's the acting um, procurement director for um, asset services. Um, so eventually, over the course of the year, maybe going into next year, I'm guessing our teams will somehow get involved with each other. What that looks like, I genuinely don't know at the moment. Um, but asset and transaction services, um, it, it's about occupier advisory. It's about managing a client's site, multi-site clients. Um, it's very, very different to the GWS part of it. But we do have similar supply chains. So how that's going to work, like I said, I'm not 100% sure, so it's a watch this space. But it's, a, it's an exciting time, and I think it's a very positive time um, for both parts of that business. Does anybody support asset services at the moment? Anybody aware of what, heard of it, know what, anything about it? Okay, it is a watch this space um, for us as well as you, really. Um, but I, I can honestly say that I think it's just going to be um, a lot of opportunity for all of us. So who we serve? So some of you will only know us from a very, very small part of our client sectors. So some of you may just purely work on um, retail with us, leisure and stadia. Maybe you're a data center supplier um, to us. Um, this is a really nice slide that shows really the full array of clients that we currently have at the moment. Um, so one of the, um, we've got some really nice growth areas at the moment. So oil and gas is a big growth area for us at the moment. Um, industrial, including manufacturing, that's a nice growth area for us at the moment. We've also got some smaller ones which are quite um, kind, of, kind of pivotal to, especially places like the London market, so heritage is a big growth area for us. So it's one of the supply chains that we're looking to grow um, quite quickly um, in the projects and in the maintenance side of the business. This is our, the footprint of us as an Amir region. Um, so we've got um, several thousand employees. Um, our biggest areas, as you can see, are the kind of like main hub of um, kind of central Europe, really. So the UK, um, Germany, um, the Benefilux region. Um, there, are, there are some really, really big numbers there. Ireland is, of course, a very big area for us. Um, we're growing quite quickly across the Middle East and Africa. There's some really, really exciting um, areas for us. Um, Rhea and I are still hankering mm -hmm. after that trip to South Africa um, <laughs> to go and support down there. Um, but you can see there that, that the, you know the growth footprint is around is around the, the central regions. Now I don't want anybody to be um, put off by that by thinking actually we're quite a small supplier that's never going to apply to us. We have no aspirational growth outside of even if it's just London or if it's Birmingham or something like that. It doesn't matter. Um, our supply chain strategy um, hasn't changed. It's not going to deviate. Our supply chain chat strategy will always be we will use the right supplier for the right client fit. So 
whether you're a global organisation, you might fit some of our client models. You might be a small two-man band working in the southwest of the country. We need all of you. Um, and so please don't be, you know, kind of put off by some of these enormous numbers that we're now talking about, or the huge geographical spread that we're talking about. There is a purpose for every single one of our supply chain. And I will touch on that when I talk about our supply chain strategy. So the growth pillars. Um, this is really how we're going to get to our um, we've got a projected growth of five billion within five years. So we're in year three of that journey now. Um, we hit our targets last year. Um, anyone who would have bet against us, you mad, you'd have absolutely lost your money. We've n we don't really hit, not hit targets. We've got a very, very determined board that makes sure that we get there all the time. Um, so the, how are we going to get to the five billion in five years? So there's five key growth pillars there. So one of them is to grow the local facilities management. So the legacy Norland... Um, way of working so th so that kind of like taking on the small multi-client type organizations so to grow that business across the EMEA region to grow our large enterprise accounts so the likes of Honeywell Mondelez so it's growing those accounts so doing organic growth on those accounts as well as winning new clients on those um, the asset services part of the business is, is a huge expansion part for us and there's a lot to go out there in the EMEA region expand project management across Europe so again, a very, very big growth area for us. Um, that there is um, Project management is very, very rich in the UK. There's a lot of spend goes through it. Um, our teams across Europe, we don't tend to do so much of it, so we're expanding that out. That's a really exciting point for us. Um, and the last one always does make me laugh, but it's just, you know, if you know Paul Savile King and his team, it's true, global data centre domination. I have no doubt. Um, we do it differently to our competitors. Um, we are incredibly good at it. We are renowned in the marketplace for being able to 100% understand a data, data centre environment and deliver to that client's needs. And you, just, you only need to look at our portfolio, really, to see that we are world-class in that area and we are going for um, global domination in that area. So, where this applies to you. So, there are supply chain solutions. So... The, the, the key word here really is bespoke solutions and supply partnerships. So we do look to ensure that the solution that we offer a client is completely and utterly bespoke to that client. We don't do a supply chain that fits all. So when we mobilise a new client, when we take on a new um, portfolio from an existing client, we will always go to that client and understand what that client wants for that site. And then we will work with the right supply partners to make sure that we fit that model. So we might have clients that actually want to support a local community. So maybe they're, uh, God knows, Wales or something like that, and they actually want to support that local community. We will 100% work with them on that. But we'll never try and push what we think is the right solution because it can be cheap or something like that. We will work with our client to tailor a supply chain that works for them and fits what they want us to deliver for them. We can only really do that by this type of engagement with our suppliers. So it's getting to know you properly. Um, we have um, around about 400 preferred suppliers across the EMEA region. Um, approved plus supplier base is growing and we're looking at the approved plus suppliers to be our preferred suppliers of the future. So our preferred supply base constantly needs refreshing, um, not taking people off, but we're growing. We're growing so rapidly that we need the, supply, the preferred partners of tomorrow. And that's what we're looking from the um, approved plus suppliers who are here in this room today. So it's for you to really understand how we work, what our expectations of you are, um, et cetera, et cetera, which is why Kelly and Ilsa is so important to deliver those messages for you. Um, because we want to, bless you. <laughs> because we want to be working with you and we want to, you to understand our culture as well as us understanding your culture. So our competency framework, so the, this is all around values. And as a preferred supplier, those who are there, those who are looking to get there in the future, um, you, you need to be mirroring your values against our values. So when you go on site, our clients don't care who you are. They, they, your CBRE, they don't care who we are partnering with. Some do, in fairness, some don't. Um, at the end of the day, you will always be representing CBRE. So you need to be underpinning your values with our values. There's nothing there that is, would be alarming to anyone. So clients first, employing the best talent, having operational excellence in your field, and innovating as much as you possibly can. Innovation tends to be a bit of a scary word, 
for some people, you know, you tend to think of millions of pounds of investment and a whole R&D lab and things like that. It doesn't need to be that, that at all. You know, sometimes the best um, innovation is just working smarter, just, you know, cutting out an unnecessary process. To me, that's innovative. You know, if you're finding a way of delivering something for, this, for the same, you know, service quality at a lesser, lesser cost or, you know, by taking out a day's maintenance or something like that, that's innovative to us. So it's about constantly evolving, constantly thinking um, and, and really mirroring your, um, uh, your values against ours. Okay, so CBRE, my supplier. I'm guessing everyone here is a prolific user. You're on it constantly. You understand all of its values. <laughs> okay, so the CBRE, my supplier platform, it has been designed for our downstream approach. So the way that we are, um, the LFM and DCF, uh, DCS business is a completely downstream model. So the buying decisions are made on the ground. We do have a large supply chain solutions team, but we're there as an advisory capacity, um, more or less. Um, the and, uh, the um, enterprise accounts part of the business are moving to a downstream model. They were more centralised procurement. We're going, everybody's moving towards a downstream approach. The CBRE My Supplier platform has been designed and written in collaboration with a partner to 100% <coughs> underpin that downstream approach. Okay, so your voice into us as a business is through this platform. If you've tried with your business development guys to send out mail shots, to ring round 200 leads and things like that, you're never going to get anywhere. Our teams are busy. You know, we've got a lot of suppliers who desperately want to get into us. You're not going to be able to portray on a flyer, an email or a phone call what makes you different. You can do that through the My Supplier platform. So when somebody is looking for a new supplier um, and they, they don't know anything about, they're looking for a decorator in Bournemouth or something like that, I'll keep it local, looking for a decorator in Bournemouth, rather than sending out a mail shot to everybody within CBRE, which did happen, or they, I don't know, pick up what was the yellow pages or Google or something like that, they are now going towards the My Supplier platform. So if your profile is not up to date, they won't see you. So boo you, you won't get that call. Um, and the, the more feedback that you get on that platform, the higher you're going to go up in the rankings. So we're using it completely in conjunction with um, QHSE. And we've also done it in line with um, the compliance team. So all of the kind of questions that our, our clients are asking us, we ha now hold that information on you. So it might look a bit of a bore, but when you look at some of the clients that we've got, you know, you will understand, you know, if we're working with GlaxoSmithKline and things like that, they're big clients, they're big names. They want to know that you're insured. There's no excuse for us not holding that data on you at the moment. So that's your responsibility to 100% keep that up. And in turn, we try to design a system that makes, that draws you into that system. So we're just about to launch the quick quote functionality on that system. The innovation tools are available for you on that system. All of this, um, the feedbacks are available for you on that system. Um, all of you in this room will have access to the promotional materials on that system. We are going to do significant development on, on it, um, probably this year, hopefully this year. It depends on how our Amir rollout goes on, where, which will really enhance the experience for you so that you'll be, you'll be able to pit yourselves against your peers in terms of ranking and things like that. No names or anything. So, you know, just so that you can gauge how your performance is against other members of your peer group and things like that. So I would really emphasise to you, if you have given that tool to your compliance person sitting in the office, your marketing team or something, you've given it to the wrong person. As our key account manager, I would expect the key account <coughs> managers to be in the room today or people who are heavily involved in gaining and retaining work from us, you need to be the owner of that platform and you need to be going into that platform at least once a week and seeing if there's um, any updates. We'll be doing all of the events through it. Um, you should be pushing for feedback through it constantly. You should be managing that feedback, whether it's good, bad or indifferent. You need to be going back to site. Thanks for the feedback. That wasn't so great feedback. What can we do to improve our services? That was fabulous feedback. Thank you very much. Can I buy you a coffee? It's all part of you getting to know us, you engaging with us, you understanding our teams. And that's how the platform has been written for you. Right, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Kelly Matheson. I'm one of the QHSC directors that works in the CBRE business for GWS EMEA. Um, thank you so much for attending today, um, especially in an afternoon where it is getting a little bit warmer down here, certainly down here, because in Scotland, um, if you see my jacket, it's like a duvet cover to keep me warm when I go back up there. Um, we're going to talk about QHSE. Yay! In the afternoon. 
But I'm going to get you to, to be a wee bit lively and talk to me for some things. But first off, I want to talk to you about risk. Okay? Um, this statement here from the Risk Appetite and Risk Tolerance Institute of Risk Management is it's a few years old now, but it's still very much in play, as I would say. Um, no company can make a profit without taking risks, and yet taking risks without consciously managing those risks can lead to a downfall of organisations. There's been a lot of high-profile down, downing of big organisations recently in the news, and smaller companies obviously feeling the result of that. So it's important when we talk about QHSE, we talk about QHSE risk and we talk about risk management. And just to give you some of the examples of things that can happen when we don't manage risk, first and foremost is about a reputation. We can have scandal, we can be in the headlines, we can be in the front papers, we can be on Google, we can be viral within seconds. You know, people have got access to Facebook, to Instagram, to all the different kind of social media that we've got available. And they could be talking about you. They could be talking about you on LinkedIn. They could be talking about your employees could be talking about you. Your competitors could be talking about you. So it's really important in terms of your brand that we think about risk and we think about reputation. We don't want to be appearing in the papers and we certainly don't want our name and our brand to be associated with any negative publicity. So that's just one example of where working with CBRE and working with larger organisations, you do have to consider our reputation, your reputation, and working together is what we're all about to make sure that we're not got situations whereby we've got bad press and bad media. Other exposures we've got? Well, we've got a lot of people who are out there. I mean, today I took um, my car, at four o'clock this morning, I left my home in Bells Hill, just outside Glasgow, for those of you that don't know where that is. I went to the airport, I got on a plane, then I got on a train. I don't think I've been on a boat today, but no. sure as, I, I, you know, it's coming quite, you know, we're on the move all the time. A lot of you will have people, maybe you've got engineers, maybe you've got members of staff that are doing, you know, working on the roads up and down the country using their phones, maybe not, you know, texting whilst they're driving. This is all exposure, particularly whether you've got vehicles that have got your company's name on them. From a personal experience that I had a couple of years ago, I had a bit of um, a situation where um, a gentleman cut me up on the road when I had my two children that were in the car, and it led to him actually causing me to come off the road. Now, that gentleman was in a company van, and I was very quickly able, through looking up social media, to identify who that company's board was, a global company, I hasten to add, and they were very quick to respond to the person that had basically put my, my children at risk. And that's the way I saw it. So that's a real life personal example for me. I'm not saying that you all would want to do that, but it just shows you how quickly something can escalate when you do have a very fiery Scottish woman mm -hmm. who her two children have just been put at risk, okay? Other things that we get, well, the more typical accidents and incidents that you can have in the workplace, okay? I'll talk to you a little bit more about general QHSE in a second. But, you know, we've, we've still got people who unfortunately come to work every morning and some of those don't make it home, you know? And we've got people that are killed on average, one person, you know, working week. It's just not acceptable in this country, you know? So that's something that we're proud to say in CBRE. We've not had any fatalities um, or significant events that have been occurring where we've had this type of event. Other things that we've got, <coughs> this is a wee picture from, um, I think I took this from the last Legionella outbreak that we had up in Edinburgh, where there was some losses of life. Now, obviously, that's big news. If you all remember back, those who remember the Barrow and Furness case, again, going back to the social media, a company, the names, suddenly you're in the headlines. And with all these kind of cases, you've got to prove your innocence. You know, that's one of the key differences with health and safety law is that you must prove your innocence. You know, you're guilty as charged unless you can do so. Then you've got office based risks, you know, um, we're on an increase now of the number of employees who are actually going off work with what they call musculoskeletal disorders. So that's things like your bad backs, your aches and your pains. Not all of it is down to old age creeping up on us. And that's one of the health and safety executives' key campaigns for this year is they're focusing on that. That coupled with stress management in the workplace, there's a real 
kind of step change in health and safety now, looking at the well-being of people, how we actually look after our welfare of our employees. And for us, that also is extended to you guys as our suppliers. We need to make sure that, yes, you're working in a health, safety, environmentally friendly way, but actually, are you looking after your people as well? Because that's, that's really important to us. And then a little bit about what we're going to cover later with compliance in terms of uh, the old um, brown paper envelopes and money getting exchanged hands. But I won't steal anyone's thunder here with that. But these are just some examples of exposure that can happen in organisations. And when we know about exposures, we also know the kind of consequences of those exposures. Now these statistics are from 2006 and the Health and Safety Executive, and the reason I've kept with this slide is I think it's good to look at it from the, this data because it's quite clear that the human cost for a minor injury, so it might be someone who's had a slip or a trip, they've had, a day, they've had to take the afternoon off work, you've maybe had to get a bit of back shift cover, it's cost you £200. If that person was to then take a week off work, you're obviously maybe going to have to pay them sick pay, you're going to have to get someone to cover their work, so the costs start to mount up. There's maybe medical expenses associated with it. What about an employee who maybe has a major injury? What we're talking about there is broken bones, you know, breaks a leg, breaks an ankle, breaks an arm, fractures some ribs. The costs start to mount up. And then on the unfortunate ones is obviously the fatalities, which how can you put the price on a human life? Well, you can't really, but the HSC's kind of looked at it in terms of an assessment. And, you know, we're close now, 2006, you're certainly going to say the cost of a human life is more than a million pounds. Now, these are the costs that you can't insure against, okay? Because these are the costs that basically are maybe through prosecutions, maybe through court expenses, lawyers, investigations, replacing staff. These are just phenomenal costs that you can't insure against. Then equally, you've got your brand reputation as a result of that. You might not get onto tender lists as a result of this. Maybe some of you, any of you's got health and safety awards in your organisation you've maybe gone for in the past. You, you won't be able to go on to these for some of them if you've had you know fatalities or you've had prohibition notices improvement notices so you kind of look and you start coming along to the kind of resource costs the loss of output they're quite staggering costs that are associated with accidents so from a risk perspective a commercial perspective it's not good to have accidents because it's not good for business you know that money is coming straight off your bottom line okay and even you know, you've got the next stage of the civil side where if someone wants to make a, a legal claim against your organisation, that may be covered by your insurance costs. However, your insurance premiums are going to go right up through the sky as well. So it's not a win-win situation for anyone at all. A little bit about what we do at CBRE then in terms of risk management, because now that we know how we could be exposed, we know how much it's going to cost us and hit us in the bottom line if we are exposed, we need to think about ways that we're actually going to manage and mitigate against that risk. Because going back to my first slide, no business can obviously, you know, we have to take risks if it's for the profit, etc. So I've kind of put it into some key areas for you, things that we focus on quite heavily. Competence of our employees, competence of our supply partners, making sure that people are competent to do the role that we've asked them to do. For you guys, it's making sure that you're sending the competent person to do the role that we've asked you to do, okay? So checks and balances and verifying. Internally for us, we make sure that when we have this phenomenal growth and we have a lot of chippy coming into the organisation or new recruits, that we are actually making sure that we are verifying their competencies. We're going back and we're checking, you know, references. We're going through competency certificates to make sure people are up to date. Have they had the latest training? No? Well, let's put a personal development plan in place. Another key thing for us is making sure we're appraising our staff as well. Again, we constantly review, check and challenge our training, our competency. We have technical specialists within our organisation who keep up to date with all the technical standards. Again, from you guys being our supply partners, we're looking for your expertise. Is there something new that's coming out that maybe we don't know about? Is there something coming down the line in a few years' time? I know there's a big focus at the moment on the, you know, the 
the taking away of the refrigerant gases and there's talk of hydrocarbons. I was talking to one of the technical guys a couple of weeks ago about this. It went over my head, but this is the kind of knowledge that we can gain from you and would be important to us because we can then advise our customers and hopefully we can all generate extra business as a result of that. Physical things kind of come down to the more kind of bespoke health and safety stuff. Hazard identification, risk assessments, going out and visiting sites, doing site surveys, not doing quotes from a desk, but actually going out and visiting the site so you can actually appreciate the hazards that are out there, appreciate the controls that are required. What we also do is we build up risk registers. So when we mobilise a contract, we will visit the sites. We will do asset verification and dilapidation reports. That might be something that you're engaged with us to do. What that is to form is a risk register for ourselves and also for our customer. It allows our customer to forward plan, to look at their capex spend, and it's just a great way of actually saying, hi, we're new, fresh pair of eyes, let's go in, have a look at your site. And a lot of our customers benefit from that, and we do too. So what I guess I'm saying there is never be afraid to come and tell us something that you think is wrong and needs fixed. Procedural, anytime we mobilise a new account, we have mobilisation plans. The procurement of our supply chain is part of that. It's a dedicated section of our mobilisation plan, as is the health and safety element of it. We have frameworks and procedures, so like yourselves, we have corporate governance procedures that we have to follow for health and safety. We have rules on how we manage our contractors and supply partners, how we monitor you, how we audit you, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Monitoring, so as a QHSE specialist, my role is to advise, coach and mentor the business. Okay. So one of the things I have to do is I have to keep myself up to date with all the changes in legislation. So there's certain ways that I do that through networking, through CPD events, through um, meeting my colleagues, meeting my peers. How many of you in the room, give me a hands up, have got dedicated QHSE professionals working in your business? Okay, all right. How many of you go to consultants for support and advice? Yeah, okay, okay. Right, those of you that have dedicated QHSE specialists, I want to get to know them, okay? So this is where networking is really key and really important because there's lots of stuff in, that I'm going to go through, lots of slides, I'm going through them quite quickly. It really goes back to the code of conduct that you'll be signing up to on my supplier. So it's not that you'll miss some information, it is in our code of conduct. But if you can get your QHSE specialist to contact me, we can start networking and we can start talking about QHSE and the important areas that CBRE has. And also there might be some little nuggets that I can, um, I can borrow from your QHSE specialist in terms of what you're doing. And um, it's true collaboration that we're aiming for. And then lastly is all the financial plans. Dare say for some of you is that one of the most important things. But one of the things we constantly do is we review. We do things every month. We have Monday morning meetings where we talk about the operational business. We have monthly contract review meetings where we look at the performance of the contract over the past month. We have that then goes up to business unit reviews, to board meetings, and that's every month that happens. So every month we are checking and challenging, basically. And that is all part of our governance. And it's just checking, challenging, testing, and making and assuring that we are doing what we say we are going to do for CBRE and for our customers. So going more onto the health and safety side of things then, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about near misses. Now, one of the things about predicting risk is about spotting the um, unsafe situations and the unsafe acts that occur. Now, unsafe acts, sometimes you might be on a site and you might not realise that it's an unsafe act because it might not be your area of competence. Unsafe situations goes back to when I'm talking about when you're first on site and you're walking around a plant room, you're maybe doing some asset verification, you're maybe quoting a project, quoting a job for us. If you spot something that's unsafe, then please report it to CBRE. We have a culture, it's hazard reporting that we've got in the business, whereby we collate all those statistics together and we will advise our customer. Um, 
The reason we do that is because we want to prevent near misses from occurring. We want to prevent the minor accidents from occurring, the major incidents, the, and lastly, the fatalities. And there's a wee slide later on that will kind of explain that a little bit more for you. But just to highlight the point, and I've got a couple of case studies here. I won't go into them in too much depth, but there's a couple of cracking videos available if you ever wanted to look at them. Um, the first one in particular is, uh, there is a really good video available of um, the Challenger Space Shuttle. And this is, this is an example of where we talk about people's behaviour and knowing things and knowing situations and how events unfold. How many of you here remember this, this accident while well, incident happening, yeah? Anyone remember watching it on the television? I remember as a kid watching it, you know. Um, I think one of the key things that I'll, if you just have a read of the slide, I'll talk to you about, is one of the ladies, uh, Christina, if I got her name right, she was a school teacher and she was going to basically be delivering the first ever lesson in space. And that's quite key to, to the story of the Challenger disaster. Okay, now, having read this, um, they were suffering um, really low temperatures at the time when the Challenger was due to basically lift off, if you like. Significantly low temperatures whereby they felt that there could be a catastrophic failure as a result if they were actually to you know, have a go, if you like. Um, a couple of days before, there was debates between the engineers. The engineers weren't actually based at where the Challenger was taken off from, but there was conference calls between the managers at NASA and the engineers of the O-ring that actually had the catastrophic failure. And the engineers had basically advised them that, that if they were to actually do a live takeoff, then there could be a catastrophic failure. Now, going back to the teacher, one of the real things, and Ronald Reagan, if you look back at this, Ronald Reagan was really um, pro this teacher going into space. This was going to be the first teacher in space, but also her first lesson was going to get delivered to you know, thousands of school children. On the day before, when the engineers were advising that there shouldn't be a lift off the next morning, the, basically, the managers went against as a decision, and this is where obviously somewhere in the truth, and you can read the, the report on it, the, the managers under pressure decided to go with the, with the takeoff because if they hadn't, then actually they would have missed the lesson because she would have been in space on the Saturday as opposed to the Friday, and all the school children would have missed out. Now, I doubt any of us, maybe some of you are budding astronauts, I'm not sure, okay? I'd like to go to Mars, but probably be a one-way trip. My husband would probably send me there on a one-way trip. But how, ma how many of us basically would ever be in that situation? We probably wouldn't be. But how many of us honestly, hand on heart, through our careers, have maybe, you know, kind of went and bowed to the pressure of maybe a manager, maybe a senior manager, just saying, get the job done, cut the corners. And that's one of the things at CBRE we have to make sure that we don't do, is where we do have something that's unsafe, an unsafe situation, an unsafe act, that we report it and we deal with it and we manage it correctly, okay? No, no job is too big, too small for us to basically just stop the job, regroup, rethink. Another example, a little bit closer to, to this location and maybe a little bit more in people's memories. If you remember the Paddington train crash, you can obviously read into that one as well. That was 31 people lost their lives and 523 people were injured. Um, signal passed at danger. Um, there's a few things when you look into this. Um, the train driver unfortunately lost his life. He had actually only been qualified to drive this turbo train for two weeks. When they looked at his training, and there's a few different root causes and you know kind of things that happened. When they looked at his training, the actual training course didn't cover anything to do with um, the signals. There was nothing where, so if we know that there's been eight near misses on this actual signal, you would have thought that drivers that are getting trained how to drive a train on that track would be advised of the potential risks that are out there. No one explained it to them at all, okay? So he put that into an example of going into the workplace. I go to a site and I recognise that the roofs on that site are maybe made of asbestos, okay? It's a fragile roof. I've got no signage up. 
I've got the access to it is on a wonky ladder, okay? I would come back, I would report that as a hazard. I would make sure that all my engineers knew about that hazard. I would make sure that it was included in an induction to make sure that people, when they come onto site, are aware of that hazard. So that's the kind of simple example of basically, we knew there was a hazard, we knew there was a risk, but we didn't advise people at all of that particular hazard or risk. Now, one of the reasons they thought that this signal was passed at danger was it was between um, a yellow and a red light, and it was the, these kind of lights that they've got. And when the sun was at a certain angle on the day in question, the actual sun's rays came through, and the, the, again, they couldn't speak to the driver, but what they thought was, was the rays of the sun made the actual signal yellow as opposed to red, so we didn't know to stop. So it's just little behaviours and things like that. It did open up a, a wider debate about um, automatic stopping on train tracks and stuff like that, and there had been a couple of earlier crashes as a result, but it shouldn't take that number of fatalities and that number of people to get injured for action to be taken, especially if we know about near misses. So lessons learned, be fascinated by near misses, okay? Even just a simple near miss of a trip hazard, of uh, unsafe wiring that you might see, depending on your field of expertise, be fascinated by it because there's probably a reason behind why things haven't happened. And for us, it's very much about advising us, you know? We will look for our suppliers to advise us of unsafe facts, unsafe conditions. Okay. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about behaviour because I think it's important to understand the kind of key things and the behaviours we're looking for when you work at CBRE. And a little bit of a history lesson, going back to just before I was born. <laughs> you can work out my age now. But in the early 70s, okay, when health and safety started and Lord Robbins came out with the Health and Safety at Work Act, which was in 1974. Before that, we had offices and industry acts and he brought them all together in a winner. We started really focusing on phys physical measures. So let's put a guard, let's put a barrier, let's stop people from getting hurt. Okay, and accidents start to come down, but then they start to come up again. Why? Because as human beings, we start to learn, I can move that barrier, I can remove that guard, so we get accidents. So then we started thinking about management systems. Let's have a procedure, okay? So how many of you out here have got the, some ISO standards, 9001, 18001, which is now replaced by 45001, 14001? Yeah, you've probably got ISOs coming out your ears. We do, we do. We have policies, we have procedures, and it's great. You know, you write your policies, you write your procedures, you maybe put them on a shelf, you maybe read them to people, and then you maybe read them to them again, and that's what happens, so your accidents start coming down. But guess what? They start tailing up again because people become familiar with it, you know. So then what we have is behaviour. And this is where the big focus is just now in, in safety land, if you like, is about people's behaviour. How do we change behaviour? Um, some people we can, some people we can't. Now, I'm going to get you all to stand up. I'm going to get you to wake up. So up on your feet, please, everyone. Okay. Now... I'm going to ask some, qu oh gosh, my voice went there. I'm going to ask you some questions here. Um, please don't sit down if you answer yes to them, because it could be embarrassing if you sit down. If you want to, then that's fine. But what we'll do is we'll all sit down at the end, and then no one's embarrassed by, by some of the questions. You're all very close now to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you ever been guilty of drinking your weekly allowance in one session? Does anyone actually even know what their weekly allowance is? <laughs> How much wine I can get out of Tesco's? <laughs> anyone ever been guilty of speeding? I'm not looking at anyone's eyes now. I'm not looking at eyes. Anyone a smoker? Guilty. Anyone an amber gambler? <laughs> anyone ever... Yeah, you know, I'll just have one, no, maybe I'll have two, I'll be all right, an hour's passed, an hour and a half's passed, yeah, but then you wake up the next day and you think, I shouldn't have drove then. Anyone ever had unprotected sex with someone you don't know too well, but they look good, so it'll be okay? <laughs> 
Taking a drug not prescribed by a doctor. Okay. Right, I'll get you all to sit down now. <laughs> Anyone here play bingo? Did you get a full house? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a wee read of this and see how many Fs you can actually spot. And this is where I need to count them again because I, I should always write this down in the back of my hand. I'm missing. Shout out how many you got? Six. 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 Yeah, there's six. Oh, let me get this. So there's finished, well, one. Files of, of. Right, we're, I'm missing them now. This is ridiculous. Oh, there you go, there you go. I've used this slide a hundred times, just shows you, doesn't it? Human error, and I've looked at it so many times. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we all read, a, you know, an instruction, so, you know, with so much detail, you know, that we got every single element of that. But let me show you this one. Can you all read that? Yeah. That is amazing, isn't it? Reading and understanding. But it's something we probably maybe don't take into consideration in the workplace as much as we should do, is people who do struggle with, with reading. And certainly one of the things that I've learned um, as we've become GWS EMEA with CBRE, I, I, I'm 11 years with the organisation, so I'm Legacy Norland. But for me, it's obviously our move into continental Europe and the languages and, you know, obviously... Um, it's, you know, it's diverse and the culture is diverse, but in a positive way because we're learning a lot from our colleagues across in continental Europe as well. <coughs> Don't know if any of you know who this lady is. Ever, ever, any of you ever heard of Catherine Susan Genovese? Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. You obviously, you see um, my pal Gordon there, my fellow Scott, okay? I'll talk to you about him in a wee minute. We'll just park Gordon, whatever you think of him for now. But let's talk a little second about behaviour setting the tone and, re and self-reinforcing. Let's give you this. Uh, Catherine Susan Getty Genovese was an American woman who unfortunately was stabbed to death in her apartment outside in Kew Gardens. This was in New York, um, in Queens, in 1964. Believe it or not, 37, possibly 38, People heard and saw what happened, but not one person contacted the police. Not one person. Yeah. So they all heard this woman being brutally murdered, but they all thought someone else was contacting the police. The most tragic thing about this was, after his first go at this woman, she was actually still alive. So had those people contacted the police, the police maybe would have got to her and maybe would have got to her hospital and she maybe could have been saved. He actually, uh, you know, they always say a murderer returns to the scene of the crime. He actually came back and finished this poor woman off. And this is known as the bystander effect. So never assume, again, go back into health and safety. Again, you know, hope nothing like that ever touches our lives. But never assume that when you see something, when you walk into a site, that someone else has reported it, okay? Because the likelihood is that they might not have. Moving on to my pal Gordon, okay? So this is in Govan. Govan's up in Glasgow, for those of you that might not be aware. Big, big old shipyard back in the day. Um, famous Scottish comedian Billy Connolly used to work there. And this is, the, at the time, Gordon Brown was the Prime Minister. They were visiting the Govan shipyard. It was uh, as a result, I think, of um, some of the work being won for the, the new warships. And um, Gordon's hair was too nice that day to wear a hard hat. So what does that say about leadership? If you're a leader in the country and you're on a site where it's mandatory, albeit there is another guy behind him not wearing it, what does it say if we are not reinforcing the standards? Okay, and that's the big thing for me, especially as user leaders in your business, is when you are out visiting our sites, come with your PPE, 
make sure you wear your PPE. I've always got the PP, my PPE in the back of my car. I mean, what kind of health and safety person wouldn't be suited and booted and looking, you know, very neon? But it is about reinforcing standards. So again, just really think about that is then when you're on sites, making sure that you, you are appropriately dressed and your teams are appropriately dressed. Um, some of our sites be aware that whilst we have in our code of conduct certain expectations that we'll expect from you, there may be additional items that our customers want. You know, it might be a mandatory eye protection site. You may have to wear flame retardant overalls in some of our sites. So again, this is really key when you are getting, you know, liaison with the account managers from CBRE is asking questions, is there any specific PPE requirements? Our code of conduct will talk through, you know, things like making sure you're wearing safety footwear with a stepped heel, ankle protection, et cetera, et cetera. But in some of our accounts, there might be specifics. So rather than obviously having to delay a job, please make sure that you find out in first place. A couple of obviously um, consequences of behaviours as well. These are two examples. Um, if you want a good movie to watch, it isn't actually that bad. For the ladies, Mark Wahlberg's in it, so Deepwater Horizon's a good video to watch. Um, I watched it thinking it'll be another, I've seen the Piper Alpha video countless times, hundreds of times in my career, which is a very good video. We use it as part of our permit to work training for our team. And there was an anniversary one done a few years back on the f by the families after Piper Alpha. But these events were foreseeable, okay? The workers didn't feel that they had an opportunity to discuss safety. They were under a culture of fear and reprisal. Now, the reason I put this slide in is because I want you to know that we have a thing called a just culture. And the next slide I'll go on to I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. But what we are recognising within our own employees and within you guys as well as our supply partners and as an extension of CBRE is that we are human, okay? We do make mistakes. Sometimes we'll make errors. Sometimes people will do violations. Now the errors, errors are things that we can really work with because we do generally make, make a mistake, okay? It might be you forgot to lock your car at night, okay? Um, I do that, my husband tells me off and then I make sure I lock it the next night until about a month later and I forget to lock the car again, okay? Now, sometimes though, you know, violations is where we do things that we know we shouldn't do but we do them on purpose and that's a little bit different and a little bit more difficult to change. In the workplace though, we see it as errors, sometimes it can be a skill-based error. So it could be that you're sending the wrong person to do the job, so they've not got the competence, so they've not got the knowledge, the training or experience to actually assess the job properly. Or it could be that they've got too much on and they just do make a genuine mistake. Sometimes skill-based errors are slips of action or lapses of memory. Um, if, I, if I asked you now, you know, basically 10 things that you saw coming up from um, downstairs to here you probably wouldn't remember because you've not thought about it but if I asked you what your favorite song was from the 80s and could you sing the words you probably could give me a good rendition of it it's because of just the way our brains actually process information so sometimes it's making sure that lapses of memory that you've got people information so for our kind of industry we want to make sure that when we're sending people to the workplace that they've got things like their safe systems of work on them, that they've got instructions, training, that they've got access, however you make it possible, you know, to manufacturers' instructions, to um, technical advice. So making sure that you guys are providing your teams with the right information so that we, you know, they've got somewhere to go. Mistakes, you can have rule-based mistakes and you can have knowledge-based mistakes. Sometimes a procedure might be wrong because things have changed. You know, um, equipment's changed. Sometimes your knowledge might be out of date. So, so sometimes these are things that we have to look at. And when, we do, um, when we do accident investigations, we will look at how all of this comes together. And we will basically, we call it the five whys. We'll say, why did this happen? Why did that, why, what caused that to happen? What caused that to happen? And if you keep asking why, you know, you will get to the actual root causes and there might be more than one root cause of why an incident happened. Violations. Violations can sometimes be routine, okay, situational or exceptional. To kind of give you an example of that, 
So let's go back to Govan Shipyard and um, Gordon Brown, he's nowhere in his hard hat. I wonder how many people the next day didn't bother to wear their hard hat, you know? I wonder how many of the apprentices that are working on the shipyard basically said, well, if he's not doing it, I'm not doing it. And he's the Prime Minister, you know? Because that's kind of how we are and that's how we roll in Glasgow, okay? But then you have situations like exceptional. So if I go back to Piper Alpha, if you ever do watch the video, there's, um, there's one gentleman who survived as a result of actually jumping off the rig. Now, when they were trained, when they went onto the oil rigs, that was one of the things that you didn't do. You didn't jump off a rig because A, there was a chance that you would obviously drown going into the water or that you could actually suffer a serious injury as a result. So that was an exceptional violation. And this is when you're actually looking at people and failures. At that point in time, that was the only option that individual had, was to violate the rules, but it was exceptional circumstances. So when we analyse why things go wrong, we do take that into consideration as well. And that's because we believe in a just culture. And a just culture, and you can, you can read all, all this that's coming up, but really a just culture, and I'll put it into, in, into my words, is every day we go to work, and we like to earn an honest buck, right? And we basically want to go to work and we want to do a good job and we want to be rewarded. We want to be able to go to that ATM at the end of the month, get our money. We want to be able to provide for our families. We want to be able to, you know, you know, watch the footy, put a coupon on, go to the pub, buy a nice new dress, a nice handbag. All these nice things we want to do because that's fair, yeah? Because we've worked hard and we want to get a nice car and a nice house and, a, and you know, a good Christmas with the family. And, and that's fair. But when you see people, and you've maybe had it in your careers, where there's people who maybe they take a few extra days off a year, or you know, sick because they want to do that. Maybe there's people that cut corners. Maybe there's people that leave a plant room messy. And little things that start to bug you, little things that start to frustrate and annoy you. And that's, that's where you basically see that it's, life's not fair. So if we put that into a work context, we're looking at understanding the just culture whereby if, if I have an employee, he goes out and he's doing an honest day's work and he, he comes in, he's got all his PPE on, he does his risk assessments, he, he basically goes and he maybe has to go to the bathroom and he comes back and he forgets to put his eye goggles on and then maybe someone spots him and says, what are you doing, you're not wearing your goggles. That's a kind of, that was a human error, that was a lapse of judgment, okay? He made a mistake, so that's a just culture. That's a toolbox talk, back to work, okay? But then maybe we've got a situation whereby maybe we've stopped a couple of guys who are using an abrasive wheel. They've not got any dust protection, they're not using any water suppression, the, you know, we've got dust going everywhere, it's going into all the instruments, they're maybe doing it in a boiler house or something crazy like that. We tell them off. Okay, we say to them, right, this is what you need to do, sort it out, guys, you know, come on, come on, we're all part of a team working together. But then maybe two days later, guess what you find? The, two, the same guys doing the same thing. Now that's different, because that's gone from being fair to not being fair, yeah? So that's what we believe in as a just culture in the sense of, you know, people will make mistakes. Some people will, it'll be a lapse of judgment. Some people will deliberately do it. Sometimes it's deliberate because it's exceptional, but sometimes it's deliberate because they just don't care and that's very hard to manage and that's very hard to deal with but what I'm trying to say to you from QHSE we're not the big bad policemen that come out there point sticks at people we're the people that understand people and we're the people that will come out we will investigate if we have to investigate an incident we will do it with you so that it's open it's transparent and that we all learn from the lessons okay any questions on that? Because it's really important that you understand kind of our culture when it comes to the just culture. Here's a good one. Any of you ever been to Skipo Airport? This is mainly pointed at the gentleman in the room. So he flew into Amsterdam. Ever seen that wee fly on the urinals? Yeah? Now, this was actually, we talk about innovation this actually came from the cleaning team at Amsterdam Airport and it was all to do, sorry with the thought in your head now, it was all to do with spillages, okay? 
Now, they came up with the idea of just putting a little fly onto the urinals would give gentlemen something to aim at. And they actually got an 80% reduction in spillages, which meant that they didn't have to clean the, the, the toilets as often. And that came from an actual cleaning operative. So sometimes the best ideas that are out there and the best ways to make behavioural change can come from your own teams. And one of the key things, I'll talk about it very briefly later, but if any of you are actually going for the new ISO 45001 standard, as at CBRE we've just went through the process, one of the key focuses of it is worker participation. So actually getting all the good ideas from your teams. And there's a simple question you can ask is, yeah, what can we do better around here? Um, I don't have the actual video, but I'd recommend if you get a chance to go onto YouTube and have a look at a video called The Lone Nut, okay? Um, the Lone Nut is, is all to do with what we call the first follower concept, okay? Um, if you have a look at the video, it's basically a, it's a, it's a guy who you would think, if you were, it's, it sits out in the middle of a park, lots and lots of young people, and this guy starts dancing, okay? And he's just dancing and he's dancing and he's dancing. And then a couple of people join in, and they all start dancing. And then before you know it, the whole park start dancing. So what they're talking about is who's the most important person? Well, it's not the guy dancing, but it's the person who actually supports the lone nut. So maybe when you think about when you're, next time you're in a meeting and you've got a guy who's got a really good idea, well, he thinks it's a good idea, guy or girl has got a really good idea, and you, you actually, no one else in the room's agreeing, but you actually agree with them, maybe try being the first follower because that might get the support to get some change put through. Setting the tone then, one of the things we will do, and we do this with a lot of our preferred suppliers, is we come out and we do a thing called a collaboration audit. And rather than a kind of, you know, a checklist audit of do you do this, do you do that, it's a more tactile feel of the behaviour of your actual organisation. Because as we meet you, we probably meet you at meetings, at workshops, maybe on social occasions, maybe at the supply partner events, etc. So we're always very much on our best behaviour, okay? But what we want to do is we want to get under that iceberg and we want to actually see the attitudes of your staff and actually... All the good stuff that you're talking to us when we know we're talking and we're negotiating contracts, we actually want to see how you tick. And, and that itself comes down to your organisational culture. So don't be surprised in the future if you have someone like me coming out and wanting to have a wee chat with you. It's not invasive, I promise. No, no needles, no, no sticks, nothing like that. So really, in a nutshell, with our culture, we have a collaborative culture. That is one of the strongest things I would say with you. We're, we're not here, certainly QHSE to, I've, I've already said it, we're not here to beat people up, we're not here to point sticks, we're not supply partners, you know, bashers or anything like that. We want to ensure that we have the best in class supply chain to work for our customers. And to be the best in class and to become world class, we need to make sure that QHSE is at the core of what you do. And it has to be at the core of what you do. It is a foundation block of our business because we don't manufacture products. We don't make widgets and things like that. We are all about our people. And if we don't look after our people, then, you know, going back to my earlier slides, you know, all we're going to get is a lot of trouble. So what we do is we do things like we have a gateway that's available to our staff where they have access to all our policies and procedures. We have uh, mandatory health and safety training that they've got to go on. We do a lot of e-learning with our teams as well. We have risk champions embedded in our business. So these are people who've maybe got a, you know, a want to get into QHSE as a profession, or maybe have just got a general interest. So they come along to our meetings, and that's certainly something if any of you's ever wanted to come along to a QHSE champion meeting to talk about any innovation in QHSE, you'd be more than welcome. Um, we have certain specialists, so all of the QHSE team within us, there's, you know, there's certain sector specialists. I kind of sit more on the oil and gas accounts, um, utilities, whereas I've got people, and, and I dare say construction, whereas we've got people who are more pharmaceutical. So there is different specialists, so I've got go-to people to go to. Um, risk profiling and heat maps. So one of the things we will do is we look at our supply chain in terms of risk. We will look at um, the geography you cover, we will look at the size of business, we'll look at the turnover that you've got with us, we'll look at the type of work that you do, um, and that gives us a bit of a risk profiling. What that does is that allows us to look at how often we need to come out and do inspections, and then also 
when you might get a collaboration audit from us. And that's normally, that normally comes um, proactively if there's a request from procurement to do that. Maybe you're going up the next stage to the preferred supplier status. Um, hopefully not the reactive stage where we're coming out as a result of accidents or incidents, you know. Where are you going to get access to this information? How do you know, How do you know if you're going to be compliant? So much people, processes, all this kind of stuff. Code of conduct. On my supplier, the code of conduct is available for you, okay? You probably, you may have ticked the box. Hopefully you've read it as well, okay? You need to read it because there is certain specific requirements that we will have in it. If any of you do any excavations for us, for instance, you have to wear flame retardant coveralls, okay? So there's little things that you would need to know about. Um, covering these very, very quickly, I will just really say competence. You need to make sure your employees are competent. Knowledge, training and experience. In the event of an accident or incident, that's what you're challenged on. That's what we're challenged on by our customers. Our clients will come out and do audits for us and they'll want us to verify. The other thing is a downstream model as well, is just so that you're aware that as we operate as a downstream model, each of our accounts operate independently of each other. So you may have a request from account A asking for competency certificates, whilst account B might ask for the same information. Okay? Just be aware of that. It is because they're operating independently from each other. Okay? Um, access and egress. Okay? Please make sure when you're attending our sites that you're authorised to attend, that you don't just um, show up and that might sound like a really simple thing but believe you me the amount of times where people have attended a site and no one's had any notification of it but equally please make sure that you're authorised to do the work and it's only the work that you've been authorised to do. We have had in the past events that, may have, that have occurred whereby we've asked people to do A but the person on site has decided to do B, C, D and E and unfortunately, when they got to E, they ended up injuring themselves. And there was no actual work order or instruction given from CBRE to do that, OK? So please make sure that you're all very clear. All work must be authorised. And when you're attending our sites, we will be making sure that you do things like inductions. You, we will be making sure that your safe systems of work, your risk assessments, method statements, competencies are available. We will be asking for these in advance. So if we're sending out an order to you to come in and do a job, we will be requesting risk assessments from you, okay? Now, if you've never visited the site, okay, appreciating for some people that might involve an overnight stay to go visit the site, one of the things we've introduced is a thing called a dynamic risk assessment. So we would still be looking for a risk assessment and method statement that covers the task that you're going to do. The dynamic risk assessment would be done to ensure that that risk assessment suits the environment that you're going to be working in. And that's mandatory across the whole of our business. So if you've got your own dynamic risk assessment, point of work assessment, whatever you may call it, one minute risk assessment, then that's fine. But if you don't have, then CBRE will supply you with documents to complete. And that's something that all of our engineers do as well. Okay? They do it electronically on their PDAs. If you do your stuff electronically, I would add, please make sure that there's a facility for us to get that information because so we can store it in our, in our site files. If you're going to be bringing any products onto site, make sure that you've got approval for that. Make sure that you provide safety data sheets and cost assessments. Talked about the dynamic risk assessment. You want to have a look at these. I can send you a copy out so you can see them. PPE. Again, should be included within your safe systems of work. Just make sure when you're talking to the account managers that everything is covered in case your client, the client that we're working with has a specific requirement. And it's more the specialist environments. You know, they might have a particular you know, eye protection you've got to wear, dust masks, etc. Please make sure your employees have got them. And obviously, you know, I say monitor their usage. Yes, monitor their usage. Come out and visit your guys. Make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do, just like I go out and check our guys. Work equipment and tools. So you'll be responsible for providing your own work equipment and tools. Just to really re-emphasize this point is that CBRE will not lend, borrow, 
give you ladders, any equipment like that. So make sure that you've costed whatever provision of work equipment you need into the jobs that you're going to be undertaking. Okay? Um, make sure that when you're bringing equipment onto site that it has been tested. If it's subject to any statutory inspections, you bring the certification with you because that's all the kind of stuff that we'll be asking for. And if we don't have it, then the job will get delayed and that's just going to cost um, you time, money and, and frustration. Housekeeping and disposal of waste. Um, each, each account will have different kind of arrangements, but please make sure that you identify how waste is to be removed. If it's you that's going to be taken off site, make sure you have the applicable consignment and waste transfer notes. Make sure we get access to those, a copy of them. Um, if it's going into the client waste streams, then make sure you've got authorization to do that. Okay. Permit to work, just a couple of more slides left. But the permit to work is for the high risk tasks. A permit to work will be issued by an authorised person. This is what they look like. Um, these are for tasks where we know there is an inherent high risk. So it could be that you're working off a mobile platform, building some scaffolding, entering a confined space, maybe doing some electrical switching, maybe um, doing some hot works. There will be an AP who will authorise that work and will issue a permit to work. That will have to be signed off by the person in charge of doing the job. That's the person who remains on site. It will be monitored and it has to be cleared and cancelled. So there's a lot more information on that within the subcontractor code, of, well, supplier code of conduct that you can review. Really, um, cooperation, communication and understanding, well, coming to meetings like this, coming along to champions meetings, meeting your local account managers, you know, getting your safety guys to contact me, to contact my peers, if you know, you're not working on one of my accounts, but they can still contact me, I don't mind. But really just, you know, getting to know us um, and, you know, QHSE people, talking to QHSE people. Monitoring of the works, just because they're on our site doesn't negate your responsibility to supervise. So making sure that you have got effective, proactive management and monitoring of your employees in place, okay? All of that is good stuff. It's making sure that we're preventing accidents, we're reducing risk. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And this here, just to show you the slides without going into hazard reporting again, we have little booklets that are available. Um, a few of our supply partners have taken them, have copied them, have made them their own. More than happy to show you one and you can take it and you can put your branding on it, not a problem. It's good if you use our one because if you complete that and give it to us, it means it fits our database. You know, so there's method in our madness, you know, but you've got everything available. So if you do see any unsafe acts, unsafe conditions, please report them to us. And then really just with that, oh, that's my little slide I told you. Unsafe behaviours, unsafe acts. What we're trying to prevent is the fatalities at the top. Um, some of the things we do with collaboration, you'll, when you go onto my supplier, you'll see this new protect protects a traffic light system. If you remember um, back in the day on construction sites, they used to have a red and yellow card system. What we did was we introduced a green card because we thought it was important that when we're actually out on site and we see supply partners working well, that we actually do give that feedback. So PROTECT is about, there's an acronym for it, which I'll just go into in a wee second. You can have a reread of it. So about promotion, responsibility, observing, training, environment, comply, total commitment, all good stuff, um, but it is on my supplier and that's something that the CBRE management teams would use. Um, we don't really want to get into a red card situation because then that goes down the road of official investigations and procurement being involved. Um, not that we don't want to work with procurement, of course we do, but it's obviously we do treat it as very serious. But the green card is just the good way of saying, yeah, this company, yeah, they're working safe. They're doing what they said they would on the town. And that's it for me. Right. If everyone can grab a seat. Okay. Looks like we're ready to start. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Ilsa. Um, I look after compliance for GWS EMEA. 
So it's a big region, big and diverse region. I've been doing this for about two years and I would say it's a very challenging role, but interesting. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit around our compliance program. So the, pro uh, the program that we've got in place um, for G uh, CBRE, GWS. Um, but I'm also going to give you some tips around things that you can do for your organization. So I'm going to try to keep things quite brief because Kelly's already uh, covered all the concepts <laughs> of risk management and things such as behavior, which obviously also uh, apply to our area to compliance as well. So in the interest of not having to repeat everything that Kelly said, I'm going to try to keep things quite brief. Um, I mean, why is compliance so important for us as an organization? Uh, we work predominantly with big corporations, multinationals, banks, um, pharma clients, and for them compliance is one of their sort of top priorities. Um, they will not engage us, CBRE, as an organization unless we, we're, we tick all the boxes from a compliance perspective. Um, these, da these days it's not a nice to have, it's just mandatory uh, to be able to work with these kind of organizations. It's something you need. So when a new RFP comes in and we are um, tendering for a big new job, um, there is a number of areas from a compliance perspective that have to be um, completed or that you have to, it's a number of boxes basically that you need to take. Otherwise, you're just not going to be awarded the work. Um, so it's really important then that we drive that down through our supply chain as well to have uh, to make sure that we uh, can deliver to those clients. Um, we also see that there is a lot of queries uh, coming from our clients around what are you doing with your supply chain? What initiatives are you taking to make sure that your comp supply chain's compliance? And there are a couple of things we're doing. We're doing screening, we're doing some monitoring, but I guess there is a lot more that we can do together. Uh, events such as these today are definitely uh, helpful, but there is more we can do. There are things such as um, in implementing whistleblowing hotlines where we can work on together. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite happy to reach out to all of you. If you have like, for instance, no, haven't got a whistleblowing hotline or a tool where employees can raise concerns uh, to look into that and work with you as to how can you implement something like that in your organization. Or they can even come to us and, and um, report things directly to us. We, we feel like it's really important to work collaboratively with all our suppliers uh, together. So we would rather hear from you that when there is a problem than us finding out ourselves. So what are the benefits from this ethical and compliant culture? What can we really gain? I think it's uh, important for us because it's a differentiator. Companies come to CBRE because they um, obviously think we are a, a very ethical organization. We've even uh, got a reward for that. For five years in a row, we have been world most ethical, ethical organization. Uh, you don't just achieve that uh, from nothing. So we have to basically uh, submit all our compliance programs and all our, uh, all everything that we do from a compliance perspective to a body that then looks into that and um, gives us that certification. So there's a lot of work that's going into that um, and we want to drive that uh, down to our supply chain as well. So I, I think, I mean, one of the things here that you can see there is this graph that shows that organizations um, which are uh, more ethical and have the highest level of ethical standards and compliance that they um, achieve more growth from a business perspective. So it's not just all about, oh, we have to invest money in compliance, it's going to cost us money. No, you'll get something back uh, at the end because you, you will grow your organization by being more compliant, more ethical, because you'll be able to work with those organizations that think that, that this is really important. I mean, or 
one of the things I wanted to go through as well is the Atisphere Institute. That's the organization that's given us the reward of most ethical organization for five years in a row. And what they say, they say is there is such a thing as an ethics premium. Companies will see uh, their share price uh, going up, revenues going up if they become more ethical. And there's been a lot of research that has gone into that. So if you go on the Atisphere Institute website, you'll find a lot of information around that. So how do we do this, this compliance culture? Um, we don't have a massive compliance team, but we work collaboratively between the different, or, uh, different uh, parts of our organization. So we've got sourcing, we've got QHSC, we've got HR, and we've got uh, compliance, oh, myself, the compliance team, um, but then we've also got data protection, data privacy team, and all those different teams, they work together collaboratively to um, instill that compliance culture in our organization. So I speak on a regular basis with all those different colleagues from throughout the organization to achieve this, our, our goals together. So on a yearly basis, what we do is we do a risk assessment. So we do a compliance risk assessment. We decide what are the major risks throughout our organization. And then based on those risks, we are going to focus our efforts. We're not just going to cover everything because it's impossible. There is, we can't just lack, we don't have unlimited resources. But we are going to focus on those areas that we believe as an organization are the highest risk for us. And that goes back to what uh, Kelly said around risk assessments earlier. So we also have a supplier assurance program in place. Um, and part of that is my supplier. So it's the, the tool where you put in all your information when you're onboarding with us as a, as a supplier. Uh, and through that tool, we'll use some of that information to make sure that you, as an organization, are able to deliver to our standard. So as Anna was saying earlier, it's really important that the information that you are putting into that tool is as accurate as possible, because we are using that information to assess whether you are the right third party for us. And we'll be also doing some, some screening because when we are engaging with you, we want to make sure that you're going to be able to um, deliver uh, as per the requirements set by our clients as well. So we'll do a number of screenings. We'll do some screenings in the background, which could be around sanctions, OFAC screening. But there is also a number of screenings that are related to the information that you're uh, putting into the my suppliers too. So, as any big organization, we have a set of values. We call we call them our rise values, and they apply to every single CBRE employee in our <laughs> organization, whether they are working in the head offices in LA or they're working on a remote site somewhere in the north of Scotland. Er, ever, those values apply to everyone. Um, the values are, um, we've got four different values, respect, integrity, service, and excellence. So from an uh, anti-corruption perspective, there is a number of laws and regulations we as an organization have to adhere to. We're a global organization uh, based in the US, so FCPA applies to us, that's the Foreign uh, Corruption Practice Act. That means that we, uh, none of our employees or no one within our organization can pay any bribes to government officials. Um, but that goes for our suppliers as well, because we can be liable uh, for what our suppliers do. So that's why we have in our standard of business conduct for our suppliers a clause about um, corruption and, and bribes. Um, we see enforcement picking up. Um, I get notifications um, from, um, from the regulators uh, and from the serious fraud office uh, about enforcement every single day. So every single day there is some new investigation into a big multinational because they have been paying bribes or receiving kickbacks, etc., etc. So it's really out there. It's, it's uh, definitely a big um, topic for us. Um, 
Maybe not so much in the UK, um, but there are a couple, I mean, since we are an EMEA-wide business, there are definitely a number of areas where we operate within EMEA that are, are, are areas of concern to me. So in terms of data privacy and security, um, similar to what I just said about uh, corruption, you see a lot of things in the news around data privacy and security breaches and big fines and multi-million pound fines uh, for certain uh, security breaches. I mean, luckily, CBRE is not an organization that holds a lot of personal data. So we don't have credit card records. We don't have um, a lot of, of the, the big bulky data um, that, that, that the banks or the financial institutions have. However, we have 70,000 employees working for us and we have information on those 70,000 employees. Uh, and that's qual qualified as personal identifiable information. So that's data that's in, in scope of the, the new GDPR uh, regulation coming up. So we are working together closely with our HR teams, with our other teams across the business, like procurement, like marketing, like sales, making sure they're all ready for um, the new regulation coming into play. However, the new regulation, new GDPR regulation, it's not a scary thing. It's not going to be a big bang on the 28th of May, on 27th of May, where the regulators are going to come into all the organizations and do a massive data audit. That's not going to be the case. However, the regulator wants you to see that you're on a journey, that you're taking steps to get there towards compliance. Um, so what the GDPR regulation about? So it's based on a couple of principles. And the first principle is notice and awareness. It, that means that if you are um, gathering data from individuals, you have to let them know that you are keeping their data or you're processing their data or you're doing something with their data. Um, also, you will have to have their consent. So they have to say, um, you, we are happy for you to use our data or to process our data. Um, an individual should also be able to come to you and say, I want to see the data that you've got on me. So you can get subject access requests. So that means that your employees or your clients or individuals that you deal with can come to you tomorrow and say, I want to see all the data that you have got on me. And they have the right to do so. And then you have to produce everything. So that means going through email servers, going through documentation, etc. So they're expecting from you to have a process in place to retrieve that data and give it to the individual. Also, they also have the right to come to you and say, I want all my data to be updated. I'm now married and I'm no longer so-and-so, but so-and-so, so you have to now update all the data that you've got on me with these new details. Or I think you've misspelled my name. Can you please um, update the documentation to make sure that my name is correct? Um, we also need to make sure that um, we only give access to data for the individuals that need to know. Coming back to the example that you gave before, if you give us passport information, we have to make sure that not all the 70,000 employees in our organization have access to that passport information, but only the individuals that need it for their role or for processing that data. Um, That brings me to the security element. So we are working very closely with our technology team, making sure that we have all the security elements in place to protect our data. Uh, so that's protecting against hackers, that's protecting, but also protecting against, let's say, in individuals from our own organization uh, accessing data that they shouldn't access. So as an example, we'll make sure that HR data is kept securely, so not 
so unauthorized people are not able to access that information. So all basically comes back to the principle on a need-to-know basis. Um, and then the last pillar of um, the new GDPR regulation is around enforcement. You will probably all have heard about the massive fines. Um, it's going to be up to 20 million or 4% of global turnover, whatever's the highest. Um, so those are the maximum fines, which, which are massive. Um, I mean, we're not expecting those kind of fines for small incidents, um, but we now have an obligation to report every single data breach to the authorities within 72 hours. 72 hours is not a very long time. So let's say if you have a data breach and it contains some of our data, you let us know and then we have to let uh, the authorities know. Um, I mean, since it's, there is a lot of different steps in the process, you're wasting time quite quickly. Um, so we, we're, I mean, we're expecting from our uh, suppliers to let us know as soon as a data breach occurs to contact someone from within our organization, to myself or Anna or it doesn't really matter, so we can get involved and work together with you to make sure that we can get it reported within the right time frame. It's not because we're gonna report something that will get a fine. No, that's, that's just part of the compliance process. So how, how can we, avoid those data breaches and losing data because that's, that's what we want to avoid here. So one of the things I've mentioned it before, confidential waste. Um, make sure that when, some, when things are confidential, put it in a confidential waste bin. That's what it's for. Don't just throw all your paperwork in the normal recycling because that uh, can be picked up by someone and there could be confidential information in there. Um, look make sure that your systems are properly looked after, that, uh, that you don't have server downtime, so that uh, the firewalls are working <coughs> accurately, etc. I mean, I'm not a technology expert, you, know, you can probably tell, but um, I think it's about making sure that your technology team is taking the right measures to um, prevent downtime, so your firewalls are working properly and the hackers can't come in. Um, make sure that when you're sending an email, send it to the right person. I mean, <laughs> I know we all make typos, human error, we spoke about it earlier, um, and everyone does. Um, I mean, we're only just human. But try to pay attention to where you're sending your emails to, because very confidential information can go through the wrong person by just getting a, co a couple of letters wrong in the email address. I mean, a good trick is um, putting a, uh, like a two, three minute delay uh, on, on sending your emails out. So our global head of legal, he has said to, to the whole compliance team, one of the things you should consider doing is putting like a, um, a delay on your sending out emails so you can recall it um, when, um, when you've realized you've made an error. Um, another thing that is frequently occur occurring is on a Friday night, you all go down the pub, down to the pub with your workmates, you have a couple of drinks, you've got your laptop back with you, and after five drinks, you don't know where it is anymore. I mean, it happens to all of us. The best thing to do or <laughs> in that case is, okay, not go down the pub. Yeah, that's, that's an option, it's not gonna happen. Put a lock on your laptop back. I mean, you can think, oh, what's, lo what's a lock gonna do? But when you're reporting that you've lost your laptop and you report it as a data breach, at least you can say, oh, it was protected. People can't just go in there um, and get the data. I mean, your laptops are supposed to be encrypted, of course. Uh, but adding that extra level of security will also be helpful when you are um, losing your laptop back yeah, in the pub. Just little things like that can, can, can help. Um, right. 
try to avoid using data sticks, and especially when they're not encrypted. Um, if you use the data stick, make sure there's a password on it. If there's no, not a password on it or it's not encrypted, just no, don't use it. That, I mean, use it for your personal pictures or, or things that you're happy to lose, but <laughs> um, don't use it for any business-related information. Um, also, don't email anything to your own, to your own personal uh, email because that's not as secure as the company network. Um, there's not the same security pre precautions in place and that, that could be uh, leading to serious issues. So, Anna's just asked me to speed up a bit, so. <laughs> I'm gonna skip a couple of slides then. I think we've touched on modern slavery already. Uh, by uh, speaking about minimum wages. Uh, we as an organization, we've got a modern slavery uh, act. Um, we've got a statement out there. Uh, one of the things that we've developed as well, we've got some posters, which we are happy to share with you. Um, so if you want to have some more information on that, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to provide. So just one more last thing is we've got an ethics hotline that's a whistleblowing hotline that means that employees can raise concerns uh, by um, contacting this hotline. They can do so anonymously or they can provide details depending on what they want and then they have the possibility to track that case. Um, it's open to our suppliers as well so if any of you have concerns about or practices you think they're not ethical please go on there and raise some concerns um, we can also help you implement something similar within your organization if you reach out to me i mean i think it's quite would be quite a good thing to work collaboratively on these kind of initiatives so We've got my details right there. Anna will probably pr provide a copy of the presentation, so feel free to reach out to me if that's something that you would like to do within your organization. Okay.